It's better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. That's the motto of the Christophers, an organization that uses mass media to encourage people to believe in their God-given abilities to help shape our world for the better. Our speaker this evening directed this worldwide effort for more than 17 years. A gifted communicator, Father John Pator is also the founder and president of St. Jude Media, a national apostolate which uses the social media to remind people of faith and of no particular faith that God is a part of their lives every day of their lives. Born and raised in New York City, Father John is a graduate of Fordham University. After two years in the United States Army, he entered Immaculate Conception Seminary in Darlington, New Jersey, and was ordained a priest. After that, he earned a doctorate from Catholic University in Kanemura. He's also the recipient of four uh, honorary degrees. He's brought a continuing touch of warmth to the newspaper industry as a syndicated columnist for CNS, the Catholic News Service. He's also brightened many bookshelves with 15 offerings, including three bestsellers, God Delights in You, World Religions, and Enjoy the Lord. He's been uh, translated into eight languages and is the topic of his presentation this evening. Through all of these activities and so many and so many others, Father Couture has fostered the flame of fidelity as a priest and spiritual companion. He is a man of deep, abiding faith and an unwavering belief in God's unchanging love, love for each and every one of us. Having worked with him for many years, it is indeed an honor to welcome him to the College of Mount St. Vincent and to the Alumni Alumni Office Annual Lenten Lecture. Please say hello, or as our students might say, put your hands together. During my years at the Christopher Seal, Sister Cecilia was my producer. We had a television show called Christopher Close Up. And for over 30 years, Seal was a producer. So one day, I hope she teaches a course here on uh, communication. She knows quite a bit about it. We used to do our shows at home box office downtown Manhattan. Anyway, a lady came up to me before this began. She said, oh, I know you. I've seen your father, father. I said, Father Couture. She said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Lent, and uh, we have to pay our uh, allegiance to the church's liturgical seasons. I got a telephone call from my secretary. I only have a secretary one day a week these days. One day a month. No, no, one day a week. Yeah. She comes in on Tuesday. And she called from somewhere else and she said, Father, I'm taking a class on. Uh, Lent and spirituality, and she says, what, what is exactly meant by Paschal mystery? And, uh, and how does it apply to me? She said, I, I can't figure that out, or I can't answer it. So being a very learned patristic scholar, I said, why don't you Google it? <laughs> she said, I already have, and I've got two pages of notes, but I don't understand it yet. So, <clears throat> Essentially, the, uh, the first part is easy. The theology is basically that the pastoral mystery is suffering the death and the resurrection of Jesus. She said, well, they told us that the focus of every mass is the pastoral mystery. How, how is that? So I said, well, let's go back to the beginning. There are two liturgical cycles in the life of the church. One is Christmas and the other is Easter. And Christmas, we know, joy to the world. Christmas is a season of joy because of the coming of the Messiah. Easter <coughs> includes not merely Lent and Easter Sunday, but 40 days of fasting, preparation for Easter. But it also includes 50 days after Easter, and it goes on to the descent of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit upon the Apostles, and Ascension, and then Trinity Sunday. 
So the whole 90 days is part of the Easter cycle. And that includes the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus as one entity. On the Easter cycle, we, we often hear that great Beethoven theme, joyful, 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 and so it goes. Da, da, da. Uh, you're not getting a baritone here, you're just getting a lecture. <laughs> I'm, uh, so the season of Christmas and the season of, of Easter are both joyful. They're calling us to joy. There's a reason for it, because if you're a faithful Catholic, that is to say, if you're rooted in the faith and you really believe it, then, and I'm going on like this waxing eloquent, and my secretary says, I still don't get it. So I said, well, look at it this way. The suffering and death, the resurrection of Jesus. He suffered, he died, and he rose again. And that's exactly what you are doing in your life. You have suffering in your life, don't you? And a lot of people around you have suffering, and that adds to your own pain and suffering. But finally, it terminates at the end of life. So Jesus died, and you're going to die. Your life is incorporated in his life in some mysterious way. But it's as certain as next summer's vacation that you are going to rise to the kingdom of heaven. That you are called and being prepared for an eternity in heaven. So the greatest, one of the great uh, mystics in the church is a, a female uh, 15th century mystic named Julian of Norwich. And she made this great statement. The greatest honor you can do, the greatest honor you can give to Almighty God, greater than your penances and your mortifications and your sacrifices, the greatest honor you can give to Almighty God is to live joyfully because of the knowledge of his love. Because of his love, he's going to save you. And you're not worthy. Nobody's worthy. You're going to be brought to heaven one day. Yes, we'll die. And yes, that's all scary. But our faith keeps us together on this incredible theme. So, the Easter cycle is called the Paschal Mystery. Because it includes, and every Mass includes, suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Christ, all in one thing. So you probably don't see it too often, but you'll find in church's liturgical writings references to the joyful season of Lent. While we, we do shroud Lent in a certain penitential spirit, and we concentrate on our own uh, inability to arise the heights of great sanctity because of our fragile nature. We need grace, and God gives us the grace. Grace abounds, as a matter of fact. But I, I said, St. Paul summed it up when he said, I live, no, not I, but Christ lives in me. And it's that spiritual awareness that we enter into the paschal mystery of Christ's life and we're absorbed as a member of the mystical body into the hmm, episodes, that part of his life where he suffered. You unite your sufferings with Jesus and you know one day there will be an end to your suffering, however severe it might be. It will end and you will rise again just as, sure, as surely as you will rise from your chairs after this talk and go your various ways. It's going to happen in your life. So with a proper perspective, when you look at the Mass, any Mass you ever attend, you look at it from the perspective of the whole Paschal history. But what is an invisible thing involved, and it has a lot to do with the way you're developing your spiritual life, 
is that you're called to joy. <coughs> joy in the knowledge of God's love. Well, you may not feel God's love. You may not feel his arms around you. You may not feel he's there when you need him. And of course, it takes great faith to say, well, I don't have to depend on my feelings. I depend on my faith. My faith in the knowledge of God's love no matter what. You know, this, this, you see a lot of Christian people, Catholics, and there's not much joy. I've been writing about some joy for 25 years, and I'm almost considered an alien when I come someplace, trying to stress joy, you know, uh, as though you can't get too far away from the cross and be authentic. I mean, if you don't preach the cross, you, you're not really preaching the gospel. But that's so truncated a view. The Paschal Mystery includes all three. And the dominant theme of the East Disciple is joy. Okay. The fact that joy is missing as a kind of an emotional support in your life very often reminds me of the story of Oh, uh, Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, if you go back to Sherlock Holmes. Those are the guys I remember when I think of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, not the modern Sherlock Holmes movies. But it's a story about <coughs> Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson go out on a camping trip. And they bring all the paraphernalia with them and they get it set up and they're out. And they are finally finished with the setup and they cook their dinner and now they're asleep. In the middle of the night, Holmes shakes Watson and says, Watson, Watson, look up, what do you see? And he says, Ooh, I see the moon. Well, what else? I see the, the Great Dipper. I, oh, Watson, Watson, are you blind? Someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> 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 you can't see what's not there, and yet when you see it, you somebody stole the tent. They should be indoors, and now they're looking at the sky. And this reminds me of the way we are with uh, the joy issue. We, we don't see the joy issue, especially at the beginning of Lent and on Ash Wednesday. <coughs> it's a great... Uh, tradition we have to prepare ourselves for a great festivity, festivity in the final uh, days of Lent when we celebrate Easter Sunday. But Tuesday is uh, Mardi Gras, and uh, yesterday was probably a wild party for a lot of people, which maybe isn't quite appropriate for a holy season, but it nevertheless has been a tradition. So I'm going to talk to you tonight on two points. One is the theology of joy, which is essentially the theology of Christianity. And the second is psychology 101. And that is, how do you apply joy to your life? How do you get it? What is the emotional connection if you don't feel joy? Of course, it's not a feeling. It's a, a byproduct. Joy is the byproduct of love. That's true in everybody's life. But here in theology, in the supernatural order, the spiritual joy that you receive, you derive from the faith in the reality of God's personal love for you. That takes something to work on. Gives you a peace and a security and also a hope. It's the beginning of joy when you begin to hope that heaven will be so sublime that everything we've ever done to reach that 